Town with the International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, and I started by asking him what the government's next steps are. Well, we'll continue to talk to our European partners to see if we can get an agreement and get an agreement as quickly as possible. Uh, time is moving on, and there's also increasing uh, worry about the, the European economy and the state of the global economy. We've seen a big slowdown in China. That's had a knock-on effect. We've seen Italy now go into recession. We've seen the German economy slow down, the French economy slow down. Uh, really, we do need to avoid any disruption uh, to that European trading system. You say that you're going to try and talk more to the EU, but at the same time, Theresa May is saying that she wants to get some changes to that withdrawal agreement. But if you look at what EU uh, politicians and leaders are saying, it simply doesn't chime with that at all. Donald Tusk says the withdrawal agreement not open for renegotiation. The Irish government says the same. Macron says the deal is not renegotiable. Juncker says it's the best and only possible deal. Is the government deluded? Well, are they really saying that they would rather not negotiate and end up in a no-deal position. I think that's uh, not a responsible approach to take. It would have an impact on the European economy, on jobs and prosperity. And for those leaders... And on the British economy. And for the, and for the British economy, absolutely. And so it's in all our interests to get to that agreement. For the EU to say, we're not going to even discuss it, seems to me quite irresponsible. So from the conversations that you're having... Do you think some EU countries are more open than others to negotiate? I think there's, as there always has been, a difference between the member states and the European Commission. I think the European Commission has a priority for the uh, political ideology of Europe about ever closer union and the four freedoms. Uh, member states who have governments who need to be re-elected have to worry about real jobs, real prosperity and real trade. Well, let's talk about the backstop, because, I mean, that was Parliament's message, wasn't it? That they'd accept the deal if the backstop uh, was effectively got rid of. But that's just not going to happen, is it? I mean, I was speaking to the Irish uh, Europe Minister last weekend. She was absolutely clear that this is not something that Ireland can possibly negotiate on. Well, if they won't negotiate on it, then they are likely to end up with no deal. And the European Union said that's the best route to get a hard border. So for the Irish, I think it's even more important than most that they are willing to talk to us about what the alternative ways are of achieving no hard border, because that's the, the stated position of both the Irish government, the British government, and indeed the European Union. One of the uh, things that may be a price for changes to the backstop is customs union. It's something that uh, uh, apparently uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has floated. It's certainly something that Labour are pushing for. Is a customs union something that you could stomach to get a deal over the line? No. Would you resign? Well, I, c I think it would not uh, fulfil the promise we made to leave the European Union. Uh, we would not be taking back control um, of our trade policy. You cannot have an independent trade policy if you're in a customs union. Turkey finds itself in that position at the moment. It can't even talk to the United Kingdom about what might happen afterwards because it's locked in a partial customs union with the EU. So would you resign if that were to become... Well, I, I, don't think so. I, don't, I, I don't think it's about us. I mean, that makes it about the politicians, not about the policy. And I think we should concentrate on the policy, and I think that would be a bad policy for the United Kingdom. Um, the other thing I'm very keen to ask you about is an extension to Article 50, um, because this is something that's increasingly been talked about, because, frankly, there's still so much stuff to get done if there's going to be any chance of uh, leaving the EU um, on the day that the government wants... To happen. Now, when we spoke in June, you said this about an extension of Article 50. I wouldn't find that politically acceptable and I couldn't support it. Is that your position still? Well, that was in the context of us not having reached an agreement and simply extending the time. I don't think that solves anything. If we actually have an agreement and it takes a little more time to get the legislation through to make that as smooth as possible, I think that is a very different argument. It sounds a bit like you're dancing on the head of a pin there. Though. No, I think there's a big difference between if we have an agreement and we need some time to get the legalities done, uh, that's, that's one thing. I think to extend, simply because we hadn't reached an agreement, uh, would not provide any impetus uh, for that agreement to be reached. And in any case, there's no guarantee the EU would want to do that. We're not ready for no deal, are we, frankly? Well, we would be able to uh, deal uh, with that scenario, but it wouldn't be in our interest to go there it seems to me we've got to guard against two things. One is um, irrational pessimism that says you know, everything will be a catastrophe 
and irrational optimism, which says everything will be absolutely okay. The truth lies between the two. Uh, if we left the European Union with no deal, there would be disruption to our trade, big disruption to European trade as well. It wouldn't be in our best interest to do that. Of course, it's survivable, but we don't want to be putting our economy into a position of unnecessary turmoil. My question, though, is if you say it's just survivable, but it could have been better than this, couldn't it, if the government had started preparing for no deal at an earlier date? This is where a lot of the issue is from, isn't it? Why weren't you preparing for no deal from day one? Well, you're sitting here in the Department for International Trade and our very existence has been about preparing for post-Brexit and we've always uh, had the view that we might get no deal, so let's try to prepare for that. Um, and across the uh, whole of the private sector, businesses okay, well, are, looking, about... are looking to see whether they can make those appropriate mitigations. Well, let's talk about the preparation for the department, because if we do leave the EU, then we're going to be losing access to 40 EU trade deals. That's 12% of our trade. How many of those have been rolled over? Well, first of all, we would not lose access to that trade because a great deal of that trade is done um, and would continue to be done uh, on world trade uh, terms. Those agreements are about worth about, so about 11.1%, but let's not quibble about 0.9%. Uh, a number of those are already signed. You know, we've signed the Australia and the New Zealand mutual recognition agreements. We've so signed how, the Chile, how many? We've signed, we've signed the Chile agreement. We're just about to sign the Swiss agreement. We've signed the Faroe Islands, which is important for fishing this week. And we'll want to bring them through as we go on. We're talking to a number of those countries about how we finalise them. Uh, and they will come, some very late in the day, uh, as we get towards the 29th of March. Still quite a small number, isn't it? It's not really, because if you look at those agreements, uh, five of those agreements represent eight out of that 11%. We hear a lot about the WTO. You're just talking there about the WTO. Um, how worried are you about the fact that this is an organisation that is going through a rocky period, to say the least? I mean, look at the way that the US is blocking or trying to block judges to the WTO. I mean, is this really the right time to be relying on this organisation? Yes, and it's in fact time to help strengthen the WTO and update the WTO. There are a whole range of issues. You mentioned just a couple of them, but there are others. Uh, the fact that uh, we have not liberalised services the way we've liberalised goods. Uh, the fact that even the differentiation between what is a good and what's a service is blurred, and yet the mechanics around governance are not clear. Um, I said to my Chinese counterpart some time ago, I said, uh, if I had asked you the question in 1995, if I sell you a, a digital code over the internet to make something on your 3D printer, have I sold you a good or a service? You wouldn't have understood that question in 1995, and yet we're using the same rules to govern the global economy um, when that global economy itself is fundamentally different. So we do need to update the WTO, and as we take up our independent seat after we leave the EU, that will be one of our great priorities. Do you worry, though, the way that some um, supporters of Brexit talk about the WTO, like this is the fix-all solution to any issues we might have if we leave the EU without a deal? Well, most of our trade, uh, most of world trade operates under WTO terms. But not but just course, on WTO, people course, have other trade deals uh, to supplement well, it. That is my point indeed. The, um, if WTO was, was so good, people wouldn't be looking to have trade agreements or customs unions, which are ways in which you can further improve on those WTO rules. And it's always seemed to me a bit strange that people would say, well, we don't need to worry about uh, having a future trade deal with Europe. We can operate on WTO terms, while at the same time saying we should have a free trade agreement with the United States uh, to get away from WTO rules. So we have to be consistent. Do you think um, that Theresa May was right or wrong to decide not to call on the services uh, of uh, Crawford Faulkner, who is the top trade negotiator at your department, someone that many people uh, are very respectful of when it comes to uh, a post-Brexit trade future for the UK? Well, let me tell you, he's not exactly um, underemployed at the moment. He's extremely busy here in this department uh, as the chief negotiator. Sounds like we a have. bit of a prepared answer, that. What do you really think? Come on. He's, uh, he, he's busy enough. I, it's not, I don't think it's, we should be delving into which bits of the civil service are used for which. It's the government policy that matters. But do you think he would do a good job if Theresa May did decide to, to use him? Oh, I think he does a great job. Um, but what do I do if he's doing something else? What do you make about the way that Theresa May's... Uh, handle the negotiations? Well, the Prime Minister has had a very difficult hand because she's not only been negotiating with the European Union at times, she's been negotiating with her own party. Um, this is a Leave country with a Remain Parliament, and it's a Parliament with no, a with, with no majority for the government. The Prime Minister has been very clear 
and I think has been very insistent on carrying out the will of the British people in the referendum. I wish more people in our parliament would do what they were elected to do, which was to fulfil the promise they made to honour that referendum. Do you think that people who don't may be punished uh, in the ballot box the next election? Then? Well, 80% of MPs in this parliament were elected on a manifesto, either Labour or Conservative, promising to honour the result of the referendum. Those who get elected on that promise and then don't follow it through once they get to Parliament, I think we'll have a difficult time with the voters the next time. And if that happens, then they deserve it.